The reason I wrote this book, okay, is, is because we are trusting this stuff. Why? Why? You know, as a mathematician, it's easy for me to say that. I'm not intimidated by math. But why are we trusting it? If an alien came down from Mars and said, I have a way of distributing numbers to teachers to tell you how good they are at teaching, I'm not going to explain it, but you can trust me. Like, we'd be like, no, how about no? We're not going to trust you, Mar Martians. But, but because we call it a mathematical algorithm, we trust it. Why aren't we demanding evidence that it works? And as someone who studies how folks at the margins often go unnoticed or left behind by the centers of technological innovation, I find our guest today to be one of the most important thinkers of our time. She is quite literally helping my world of anthropological study call the question on what exactly is big data, um, it, what it is and how it works. She gives us the tools to challenge those who use the mysterious beauty of mathematics to distort, obscure, and flat out bamboozle an otherwise trusting public ill-equipped to register the computational hijinks at hand. Kathy O'Neill's work helps us, in other words, suit up to defend ourselves. So two important data points. Kathy is a mathematician. She is also a compelling, accomplished writer. She's the author of the blog mathbabe.org and the book On Being a Data Skeptic. She also co-authored with Rachel Schutt, Doing Data Science, Straight Talk from the Front Line. I recommend, recommend all of those books. Um, but Kathy's latest book, Weapons of Math Destruction, is the subject of today's talk. Hey, um, so glad to be here. I'm gonna stay for Q&A. Um, but I do have like a, a 40, 50 minute talk to give you first to provoke the conversation. My favorite part is the conversation. But we need to know what we're talking about. So the very first thing I want to define is what do I mean by an algorithm or a model? I'll use them interchangeably, although not everyone does. So I want to define my terms. As a mathematician, I feel like defining terms is pretty important. This is my son, Wolfie. He loves Nutella. That'll come in handy in a second. So my claim is that an algorithm is just something we, uh, we build with data and a definition of success, data, a definition of success, um, to make predictions about the future. And, and, and we also make the assumption that things that happened in the past will kind of repeat. So there's a sort of historical precedents um, will we'll sort of be, we'll have similar kinds of patterns in the future. So everybody actually uses algorithms. They don't always write them down. They're not always formal. They're not always put into code. But this is, this is an example. I'm going to show you an example of how we all do this. So my example, which I also write, wrote about in my book, is cooking dinner for my family. So I have three sons. I have a husband. My husband's a terrible cook. Um, I, build, I go into my kitchen every night, and I think to myself, what am I going to make for dinner for this, for this crew? The data I use is the ingredients in my kitchen, the amount of time I have, the amount of ambition I have for that particular evening. Now, I already lied. When I say the ingredients in my kitchen, I actually curate that. My oldest son loves those little packages of ramen noodles, those little plastic packages. I don't really think that's food. So I. I exclude that as a potential ingredient in my, in my dinner. I'm imposing my agenda on my data. I decide what's relevant. And that's what we always do when we build models. We curate, even when without thinking about it. I also probably don't think of marshmallow fluff as an ingredient in my dinner. I don't think about it very, very consciously, but I am definitely excluding things. Then I cook the dinner, we eat it, and then after, after the dinner, I assess, was this a successful meal? We all do that. Well, it all depends. What do you mean by success? How do I define success? And I, the answer is for me, I define success. A, a dinner was successful if my kids ate vegetables. OK? Well, that would be different if my son were in charge, right? He would define success as a dinner where he got to eat Nutella. So that's a very, very important lesson about algorithms. Algorithms are defined with values embedded in them 
And that those values, that agenda, is, is decided by the builder of the algorithm. And that's important because most of the algorithms that hit us on a daily basis, influence our lives, make decisions for us, are represented as objective. And, and often as unappealable because they are so true. But they're not. They are actually imposing an, a hidden agenda, usually. And that agenda is usually to make as much profit as possible. If it's corporate algorithm, or if it's a government algorithm, to make things as efficient as possible, or cost saving, or something like that. And we'll talk about that. But I just, I want to, from, from right off the bat, know what an algorithm is, and know that no algorithm is objective. There is no such thing as objectivity when you have to specifically choose a value system, which you do. OK. Now, it's also important for me to tell you, I don't care about most algorithms, and neither should you. Nobody in this room should go home and worry about the dinner algorithm I use to make dinner for my, my family. Um, it's really unimportant. And I didn't even write it down in code. And even if I did write it down in code, you wouldn't care about it, and you shouldn't. So which algorithms should we worry about, if any? That's, that was like probably the, the most important thing I'm trying to get to in my book is there are algorithms out there that we actually all should worry about, that they are so important and so destructive that they actually are acting as sort of secret laws in our country and destroying um, the fabric of society. So they are characterized as the following three characteristics. They're widespread, by which I mean they affect a lot of people in important ways. So they'll decide whether you get a job. They'll decide how long you go to prison. They'll decide how much you pay for insurance, et cetera. And things that people actually care about that make it an, an impact on their lives. Second, they're secret. They're mysterious. People do not understand them. They don't, and they're usually scoring systems, I should say. So they don't understand their scores. What is the formula that gave me that score? I have no idea. I can't explain it. I can't understand it. Often, they don't even know that they have been scored. Especially when you're online, what's your score? You don't know. It's, it's totally hidden from you. I'll give you one example just to, just to illustrate this. And most of my examples, I should mention, are not online. You might have thought, oh, big data, that must be online. No. Most of the examples will not be online. This one is um, related to online. Because um, online information about you leaks. It's sold. It's packaged by these big data warehousing companies called Axiom and others. And they profile everybody in the country, sell them to political campaigns, et cetera. Here's one way they're used. When you call customer service, they'll look you up with your phone number, decide whether you're a high value or low value customer, in part by your profiles. And then if you're a low value customer, you'll be on hold forever. If you're a high-value customer, you'll be talking to a representative. It's a minor thing, but it's a great illustration of how you will not know that's happening to you, completely invisible to you. And if you are scored wrongly, if you're actually a high-value customer, but they think you're a low-value customer, how are you going to appeal that? OK, so these things, the ones I want you to care about, that's not one of them. It has to be important. It's not that it's not important enough, unless it happens to you every day all the time. It's secret, but the most important thing is that it's destructive. It's unfair. It makes mistakes, and it ruins people's lives. Or it imp impacts their lives unfairly. Now, I'll, I'll say that on an individual, individual level, that's how I define that. But as an observation, we'll come back to this. As an observation, algorithms that have these three characteristics have yet another one, which is what I call destructive at the societal level. They create feedback loops, in fact pernicious feedback loops that usually undermine their original goal. We'll see that. We'll see this in this first example. This is coming from the war on teachers, as I call it. Um, it's a, it, it goes back a couple decades. We have had a bunch of, of presidents who want to be the president that fixed education. I don't think Trump has claimed to be one of those. Um, but the, the few presidents before them, before Trump, have made that claim. And what they mean by that is they want to close the achievement gap. The achievement gap is the difference in average test scores from poor kids and rich kids. And that achievement gap has been widening in the last few decades. It's important to know, people often lose sight of this, that both poor kids and rich kids have gotten better at tests. 
So if you believe in test scores as a good measurement of underlying knowledge, that means that everyone's gotten more knowledge. But rich kids have been getting better faster. So the gap has been widening. And this has been a big political issue. We want to close the achievement gap. I want, want to add another piece of this puzzle, which is that the achievement gap is a fact throughout our history. As long as we've been measuring test scores along, along income lines, it's been true. It's also been true in every other country. It is almost, you might say, you might imagine, um, an artifact of inequality itself. Not to say that it has to be a specific width, right? So it's always a good idea to try to narrow that gap. But the approach that's been taken by the education reform movement has been, let's get rid of bad teachers, then we'll get rid of the achievement gap. We'll find the bad teachers, get rid of them, and the achievement gap will go away. So knowing what we know, we probably won't go away entirely, but we, it might get it smaller. And there's never, it's never a bad idea to get rid of bad teachers. But how have we been doing it? The first generation of getting bad, rid of bad teachers, well, you have to define them first, right? You have to locate bad teachers. Well, we locate them through test scores. And the first way we did it was really stupid. What we did was we defined a teacher to be bad if a large majority of their students didn't pass a certain level of proficiency in their standardized tests. Why is that stupid? Knowing what we do know about the correlation between poverty and bad test scores. Knowing that poor kids don't do well on tests. Well, marking a teacher bad because a lot of their kids do badly on tests means you are targeting teachers of poor kids overwhelmingly. Does that make sense? So it's patently unfair. You can't just say every teacher of a poor kid is a bad teacher. Stupid. Um, so in fact, what we want to do is we want to find the good teachers of the poor kids and encourage them. So we're going to come up with, we came up with a second version of find the bad teacher. And it was called the value added model for teachers. And it was a pretty interesting idea, which didn't work at all. Here was the interesting idea. The idea was don't hold a teacher accountable for the score of a student at the end of the year. Hold them accountable for how much they did better than expected or worse than expected. OK, so imagine you guys are my fourth grade class. I'm your teacher. You came in at the beginning of fourth grade with an expected score at the end of fourth grade. It was based in large part on the end of third grade score that you guys all had. Not entirely, though. It's complicated. It also involves how many kids are in the class, which classroom this is, uh, which school system we're in, Attributes about the, the aggregate statistics in the class, like how many of you guys qualified for a free lunch, which is a proxy for poverty. But anyway, you all came in with an expected score. Let's say your score was expected to be 70, but at the end of the year, you got a 75. Your actual score was 75. I would be held accountable for that difference. That would be my value added for you. I did better than expected. Five points to me. If you were supposed to get a 70, but you got a 65, I screwed up. I'm held accountable for that difference. Does that make sense? Now, a couple problems with this. The first is, it's actually really hard to predict someone's score in a year. It's kind of ridiculous to imagine that on the first day of fourth grade, I already know what you're going to get at the end of fourth grade. There is uncertainty attached to that. Lots of things can happen to kids in a year. Uncertainty. There's also uncertainty attached to the actual score you get. If you were hungry that day because you didn't have breakfast, different score. If you didn't sleep well, different score. If it was hot outside but no air conditioning in the school, a different score. If the, if the test itself was harder this year, different score. Does that make sense? Two uncertain numbers, you're taking the difference, even more uncertain. If you're a statistical-minded person, you'll realize that the difference here we're talking about, the five points up or down, is actually called the error term in the original model, which was the expected score model, also called the noise term. Now, if you're not a statistician, you're going to hear that and say, noise term, that sounds kind of noisy. It does, right? And not only that, but I'm a teacher. This is much larger than a normal class. Usually, I have 25 kids, 30 kids. 
So I'm being assessed, held accountable for 30 noise terms. I learned it this much by reading about the value-added model when my friend told me, who's a principal at a high school of a high school in Brooklyn, told me her teachers were being assessed by this secret algorithm. You guys, you can sit over here on the, on the side if you want. And I said, well, why don't you show me the formula? Get the formula, show it to me, and I'll explain it to you. I'm a mathematician, after all, and a data scientist at this point. And she said, oh, well, I asked my Department of Education contact for that, but they told me it's math and you won't understand it. That reminded me of being in finance, where we were doing these AAA rated mortgages and telling everyone, you can trust us because we're mathematicians, but we won't explain it to you. That did not end well. So that was a bad sign. Then something happened that was kind of nasty. The New York Post filed a Freedom of Information Act request, a FOIA request, and got all the teachers' names and scores in New York City and posted them as an act of teacher shaming. I think the title of the article was something along the lines, the 20 worst teachers in New York City. So they were tr treating those scores as if they were true, objective, following the numbers. Well, that gave me an idea. If those guys can FOIA the scores, I should be able to FOIA the formula. So I filed the Freedom of Information Act request too, but I was denied. And then through back channels, I found someone who actually works at the place that built them, which was in Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, at a think tank. And I talked to them and they said, oh, by the terms of our contract with the city of New York, you will never see this because it's proprietary, nor will anyone in New York City, ever. But I was like, wait a second, their tenure is on the line here. So you're telling me that the superintendent of schools, the principals, Nobody can explain to the teachers how they're being assessed, even though their tenure depends on this. That is some bullshit. And then I gave up, because I was like, I don't know how to prove this stuff is meaningless, noisy stuff. Because it sounded very noisy to me, but I was like, I don't have proof. Then somebody very, very smart came along, Gary Rubenstein, who is a high school math teacher at Stuyvesant High School. He has a blog. And what he did was he looked back at that New York Post data, and he found more than 600 teachers who had actually gotten two scores the same year for the same subject. This could have happened if they taught seventh grade math and eighth grade math, or eighth grade English and ninth grade English. And then he figured, well, I'll look at those scores because they're supposed to tell you, are you a good teacher? Shouldn't have to depend on the grade, right? They should be consistent, right? He plotted them. <laughs> I love it when like a scatter plot is a laugh line. That's <laughs> so this is almost random. This is almost uniform distribution. It is actually 24% correlation. Just to be clear, this is a teacher who got an 88, very good teacher, and a zero, terrible teacher, at the same moment. This is far too inconsistent to be holding individuals accountable. Even so, in Washington, D.C., where this was also being used, Sarah Wasaki got fired, along with 205 other teachers the same year, because of a terrible overall teacher score, half of which was the value-added model score. The other half of which was a principal assessment, which is almost always the same for every teacher. So it doesn't really add much to the variance of the overall score. She got fired. A little more about Sarah. She was a great teacher, had great um, recommendations from both parents and principals her principal, but she was a fourth grade teacher, many of whom, her, many of her students came in from third grade with high test scores from their previous elementary school, Barnard Elementary, but they had, they couldn't read or write. Oh, I forgot to mention that the superintendent, Michelle Ree, had not only instituted these, uh, the sticks, the firings for bad scores, but also bonuses for good scores, carrots. So there was very strong incentives in that system to cheat. So her kids came in from into fourth grade with great scores from the previous year, couldn't read or write, and she found out that in that school there were an unusual number of erasures in the tests. And an investigation was proposed but never actually gone, went through. 
So she, but, but Sarah, who had just gotten fired, now just remember, if you have some kids that were expected to get a really high score but didn't, because they were, had inflated scores, that would make her Sarah look bad. Does that make sense? So she thinks, like, wait a second, you guys cheated, and then that lowered my value-added model score. I want to appeal this. She tried to appeal it, but she was told it's mathematics and it's fair. I should also say it was being used in 26 states at the time. Um, I don't know how many states are still using it, but it's fair to say that this is a widespread problem. It's very secret, and it is destructive on the individual level, like for Sarah, who got fired. Last thing about Sarah, she got hired the next week at an affluent suburb of Washington, D.C. This, this, this is mostly used in, in urban school districts, poor kids. So the question I want to ask is, has this just been destructive on the individual level, or is it, in fact, undermining its original goal? Because remember, its original goal was get rid of the bad teachers, close the achievement gap. Let's examine that. My claim is that it has actually not gotten rid of the bad teachers. It's gotten rid of good teachers. Good teachers have retired. They've uh, they quit. They have gone to private schools or affluent suburb school, suburban schools where this, this situation isn't enforced. And now we have a national teacher shortage. But in any case, I don't think you can argue that this has been good for those poor kids or has it in, uh, lowered the achievement gap. The next class of examples comes from getting hired at a job. How many of you guys have ever taken personality tests? Wow. 70% of people in this country have to take a personality test in order to get an interview for a job. And it's 57% in the UK. It's very, very common. It used to be easy to game these tests because you know what your manager wants to hear. Agree or disagree, I'm always happy. OK. <laughs> Nowadays, it's a lot harder. What do you agree with more? I sometimes get confused by my thoughts and feelings. I don't really like to have to, when I have to do something I haven't done before. Imagine answering 60 questions like that. <laughs> this is Kyle Beam. He failed his personality test. So Kyle was a straight-A student in high school. He went to Vanderbilt University. He had to take some time off to be treated for bipolar disorder. <coughs> he was treated. He went back to school. And then he decided to get a part-time job at a grocery store called Kroger's Grocery in Atlanta, Georgia. And his friend was working there, and his friend was planning to leave. His friend said, oh, my manager said you can have the job, just do the paperwork online. So he went online, he did the paperwork. One of those things was a personality test. He took the personality test and he never heard back. And Kyle is unusual, actually, in two ways. The first way is that he found out he failed. Most people just never hear back and they never find out anything else. But since Kyle had this personal connection, he said, what's going on? Your manager hasn't gotten back to me. And his friend said, oh, he told me that you were red lighted. You failed. OK, the other way Kyle's unusual is that his father's a lawyer. Most people taking these personality tests, which are almost, they're not, for, not exclusively, but often for minimum wage work, do not have access to a lawyer. So his father, Roland, asked Kyle, what were the questions on the personality test that you got red lighted for? And Kyle said, well, a lot of them seemed a little bit like, a lot like the, the mental health assessments I was given at the hospital, the five-factor model also called the ocean score model, if you guys have heard of that. His father said, wait a second, that's illegal. That Under the Americans with Disability Act, it is illegal to force you to take a health exam, including a mental health exam, as part of a hiring process. And his father has sued, has filed a class action lawsuit against Kroger's on behalf of everyone who ever took that test. In fact, he asked Kyle to apply to six other companies for work. He failed all of them with the same exact test. And his father has filed a class action lawsuit against all of them, <laughs> which is cool. But it also shows you, it also shows you, going back to the, the three characteristics of a weapon of mass destruction, that this is destructive. It, uh, it's being used everywhere, widespread. Sorry, it's widespread because it's being used everywhere. It's secret, obviously. 
but it's also destructive to the individual Kyle, but it's scaled, right? So it means that Kyle couldn't get a job anywhere. And in fact, it is exactly doing what the Americans with Disability Act was created to prevent, which is a systematic filtering out of people with mental health status. So it's that pernicious feedback loop. Okay, so this is Roger Ailes. You guys know who that is? Yeah. Um, so this is the time of my talk where I'd like to do a thought experiment with the crowd. Um, and those of you guys who were at the AI Now conference yesterday might have heard me say this, but so you guys are all experts now on machine learning, right? <laughs> you know what it takes to build an algorithm. That's all you need to know, really. It's not that complicated. Don't be intimidated. Historical data and a definition of success. Okay, so here's a thought experiment. Roger Ailes was kicked out after 20 years, after founding Fox News, for systematically harassing women. And then Bill O'Reilly was kicked out even more recently for exactly the same thing. Uh, 25 women came forward to complain about Roger Ailes. A bunch of women have complained. There's also racial complaints, complaints about racial harassment. It's just like a big mess. <laughs> Okay, for the, 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 for the sake of the thought experiment, I want you to think about it this way. Women were systematically prevented from being successful at Fox News. Okay, I think that's a fair summary. My thought experiment is, what if Fox News decided to turn over a new leaf to improve their hiring process by replacing with a machine learning algorithm in the hopes that that would make them more objective and more fair? and better PR, too. Okay, so let's, let's think about this. And I'll, I'll imagine myself being hired by Fox News to do this. I'm a data scientist. I work on consulting gigs. So I go in there, and I know that I'm going to build a machine learning algorithm to hire people. This is standard stuff. It's actually being done in white collar jobs all over the place. The first thing you do is you find a relevant data set, historical relevant data set. Dude, we have 21 years of people applying for jobs at Fox News. Some of them get the job or get the offer. Some of them take the offer. Some of them come and they're successful. Some of them come and they're not successful. All that data is useful. The other thing I need to know, of course, to define is what, it, what do I mean by successful? What does that mean? Well, what do you guys think it means to be successful in a, let's just say, a generic white collar job? <laughs> How about you spend a long time there? You're, you have a long tenure. You're there for at least four years, let's say. How about you're given a raise or a promotion? Does that make sense? Okay. So let's define success here to be you're, you stay for four years, you're promoted at least once. Very reasonable choices I've made, aren't they? I chose a relevant data set and a reasonable definition of success. I am feeling pretty professional right now. I do my algorithm, I train my algorithm, neural nets, who, who knows, decision trees, random forest, something. And I, I optimize to accuracy. I'm feeling very professional. And then I apply it to a new, a current pool of applicants, current pool of applicants who want to work at Fox News. What happens? Right, it filters out women because they don't look like people who were successful in the past. Pattern matching. It builds a profile of someone who was successful by my definition of success in the past. Women did not fit that profile. So what does machine learning do? Does it make things fair? No, it doesn't make things fair. It propagates past practices. It, it, makes the, what, it automates the status quo. Which is to say, if we had a perfect status quo, we found a job where we hired exactly the most qualified people, we promoted the best people, we gave raises in a very fair way, and the culture was so um, pleasant that great people decided, I want to stay here, then we would want to automate that. We'd be like, oh, it, it, dude, it's perfect. Let's crystallize this in stone put it in an algorithm and keep it going. But that's typically not what we're doing, right? I chose Fox News because it's an extreme example and it's obvious what would happen. Every single company has implicit bias. Every time we look for implicit bias, we find it. 
So the assumption for a data scientist cannot be that if I use relevant data sets and a reasonable definition of success and I optimize to accuracy, I've done my job. You have to test things for implicit bias and correct them. So I already made the case that personality tests are WMDs. I claim that as these kinds of hiring algorithms become more ubiquitous, they will also represent weapons of math destruction as long as we do not do that extra step of testing for implicit bias. So predictive policing is my next topic. Um, I'll tell you what predictive policing is. Predictive policing is take a bunch of um, proxy, you have a proxy for crime, just start with that, proxy for crime, data that represents crime. What do you think we're gonna use for that? What's a good proxy for crime? Arrests, reported crimes, convictions. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna choose between arrests and reported crimes, because actually the predictive policing can go either way. Both of them are terrible. Very, very terrible proxies for crime. In fact, most crimes are ne do not lead to arrests and are not reported. Um, and the problem we have on top of that is that we have the lack of, re of arrested crimes are unevenly distributed. And that's because we have way more police in certain neighborhoods than in others. Okay, so I want you to think about this not as me saying these people shouldn't have been arrested because they didn't commit a crime, but we have a lot of crimes that go unarrested, okay? What that means is that we have a very strong bias to have certain kinds of arrests in certain neighborhoods, especially poor black neighborhoods. Now, why does that matter? Because the way predictive policing does it is it looks for the locations of past crimes, which in this case are locations of past arrests, and then it predicts the location of the next crime. What's gonna happen in the era of broken windows policing, the uneven policing, when you do that? When you say, let's look at the location of previous arrests, try to predict the location of the next crime. It's just gonna keep the same, propagate the same feedback loop where you have cops going back to the same exact locations where they were already over policing. Whoa. Batteries are running low. Okay. I am saying this to you, that the arrests, thank you, that arrests are bad proxies for crime, and they're unevenly bad, right, unevenly bad. But where's my statistical evidence? And that's one of the most frustrating things about talking to people about predictive policing, is that it's really, you don't have that much evidence for missing data. How do you give evidence for missing data? Um, and, and we have statistical evidence of profiling in, in Chicago. This is the from coming from the Chicago Police Commission report. This shows you that this is just for like stops for searching for contraband, suspected contraband in cars. It shows you that you're much more likely to be stopped if you're a black driver than if you're a white driver. In fact, the average black driver can be, can be expected to stop one every two years, once every two years but you're also less likely to actually be caught with contraband if you're black than if you're white, which is a way of saying that they, have, they stop white drivers for better reasons, right? That's an evidence of profiling. Here's the only, literally the only ground truth we actually have on this bias, and I don't have the first graph which says whites and blacks smoke pot at the same rate, but it's very easy to find that data. Whites and blacks smoke pot at the same rate. Blacks get arrested for smoking pot at approximately five times more often. This is in New York City, but it's true across the country. In fact, there's actually a, another graph I got once, a histogram of how much more often blacks are arrested than whites for smoking pot. And it varies between like two to 10, which is to say it's much more about police practice than it is about crime itself. Does that make sense? So we have a very, uneven way of policing, and then we pretend that arrests are perfect proxies for crimes, we plug it into this algorithm, and it sends the cops back to exactly the same neighborhoods and continues the process. Another way of thinking about this um, thought experiment, because I love thought experiments, is like, af if after the financial crisis, 
we had sent all the cops down to Wall Street to arrest the bankers, um, which would have been great. Then the data would have said, go to Wall Street because that's where the crime is. Right? We didn't do that. But that was a, that was a political choice, a social choice of how we, how we ask the police to behave. So I often say that the predictive policing algorithm is predicting police just as much as it's predicting crime. It is a weapon of mass destruction for the reasons I said. This is also called hotspot policing. It is used in every major city in the United States and many in the UK. It's absolutely mysterious even to the police that are being sent to neighborhoods. They don't even know why. And it's destructive, as I said, because it continues this feedback loop, which I consider con con um, destructive. So take a pause. I have a couple more examples that will alarm you. But I also have an al alarming thing to say about trying to solve these problems. How would we solve them even if we had access to those algorithms? Because I should have mentioned predictive policing, also I can't FOIA. Every predictive policing algorithm, as far as I know, is proprietary, made by some private company and contracted to the cities that use it. It's complicated too. Even if I had the access to it, I wouldn't be able to interpret it. So we have a lot of work to do to try to audit these algorithms for fairness, to try to explain to people, don't trust this algorithm. It's not going to make things better. It might th make things worse. Here's the algorithm that actually kept me up at night when I was researching my book. It's called recidivism risk. How many of you guys have heard of it? About half. I'm so glad that to hear that because I hadn't heard of it four years ago. And now I think that people are really hearing about it. There's been a lot of great work done recently with by ProPublica and lots of conversations we could talk about in Q&A. But basically the idea is this, recidivism risk is a, is a risk score that's handed to a judge during sentencing, bail, or parole hearings. And the idea was to get judges to be more objective because judges are actually famously racist. The idea was make them less racist by giving them objective truth. Problem is that it's not objective. Recidivism risk is the risk of returning to prison after leaving it. So 97 people, 97% of prisoners leave eventually. The question is, do they return? And the, and the argument for, for considering this question is a public safety argument. Like, if they're very likely to commit yet another violent crime, do we really want them to leave soon? Unfortunately, the way it's actually defined as an algorithm is not, has nothing to do with violent crime. Literally is, how likely are you to return to prison or even get arrested in the next two years after you leave? Get arrested. You could be getting arrested for Crimes of poverty, addiction. You know who's a really high recidivism risk? Addicts. Poor people who pee on the sidewalk because there's no public restrooms. Still counts. If you get arrested, high recidivism risk. Does that make sense? So that's already a problem. But here's a real problem. The way the scores are created are themselves proxies for race and class. So on the one hand, it's the crime records, the arrest records, and the conviction records, which are all extremely biased but for the re same reason we just talked about. But also there's a questionnaire, and the questionnaire is so problematic. Are you unemployed? Were you suspended from high school, which is a proxy for crime, for race, I'm sorry? Are you on welfare? This is a criminal history. This is the worst of all. Is your father in prison? Was your father ever in prison? That is actually an unconstitutional question. If a lawyer stood up and say, Your Honor, to say, Your Honor, please sentence this, this defendant for longer in prison because their father's in prison, the judge would say, Well, that's an unconstitutional um, way of thinking about it. So I, no, sit down. But because it's been embedded into this risk score and handed to the judge and described as objective, it is used. Um, here's some more, uh, basically, are you an addict? 
you have a mental health problem, also makes your score worse. And here's like the most Orwellian one. Um, do you have a poor attitude? So this is, by the way, this is the LSIR, most commonly used recidivism risk. It's used in more than half the states. I found another one where the question literally was, a little bit less popular than this one, but the, this, this section of it was actually asking the question, do you think the system is rigged against you? <laughs> and if you said yes, then it was. <laughs> I mean, it's like funny, but not funny, because the truth is, these are used to sentence people to longer in prison. And just by being from the wrong neighborhood, you're getting sentenced to longer because you're higher risk. Again, you are higher risk. This is, this is optimized to accuracy. But the question you should be asking yourself is, are you higher risk because you're more criminal or because you happen to live in a neighborhood where police are more likely to arrest you? It's, a, it's also a, um, a a police prediction tool. This is just a, a histogram to demonstrate that suspensions are proxies for race, high school for suspensions. Um, I didn't finish this off by saying this is a weapon of math destruction, but this is a weapon of math destruction. It's widespread, absolutely. In fact, if anything, people on the left and the right are pushing this as the new way of thinking about decreasing mass incarceration because they think because it's scientific, it's so much more fair. They're even considering letting people out of prison based on their recidivism risk scores. If they do that, of course, they'll be letting out richer, whiter people from prison. That's their solution to mass incarceration. It's a problem. It's also destructive at the individual level when it's unfairly sending people to prison, but it also is creating a pernicious feedback loop of having someone just by dint of their demographics in prison longer, and then um, nobody actually benefits from being in prison longer, just to be clear. And then they get out of prison, they have even fewer resources, fewer connections to community, less wealth, a felony on their name, and they end up back in prison. So it's actually creating its own reality. Final example, for-profit colleges and payday lenders. And a little story about this. After I left finance and joined Occupy, I worked at a company in data science, trying not to feel guilty about what I was doing. And I was doing online advertising for travel sites, like Expedia. Should I show this person who just came to Expedia.com an advertisement for comparison shopping for hotels somewhere else? Sounds pretty benign, doesn't it? I thought so. And then one day, a venture capitalist came to our company because he was thinking of investing in our firm. Venture capitalists are the ones who have the, hold the purse strings in the internet economy. So they are somehow, you should think of them as the architects of the internet economy because they decide what gets funded. So this guy was brought to before us. And we all listened to him about what the future of tailored advertising will look like. And he gave us his vision. And his vision was, I can't wait for the day when all I see are trips to Aruba and jet skis. And I never again have to see a, univers a University of Phoenix ad because those aren't for people like me. And people laughed. And I did not laugh because I was like, dude, what happened to the democratizing force of the internet where everyone has access to information? Um, but also, I didn't really know what the University of Phoenix was, to be honest. This was 2011. I wasn't getting out to the University of Phoenix. And I was like, huh, I wonder what that is. And I went incognito. And I, I said, you know, I, I did tests. I was just like, just super stupid little tests for myself. I want to go to a good college. Oh, like Harvard, Columbia, blah, blah, blah. Incognito, I want to go to a college. It said, University of Phoenix. And I was like, oh, I wonder how big this is. I went and looked at who had spent a bunch of money on Google. Apollo Group, which was the parent company of University of Phoenix, was the number one Google ad buyer that quarter, $350 million. It's a big thing. I eventually found out just how predatory for-profit colleges as an industry have been. Obama's administration shut down quite a few of them, ITT as well as Corinthian College. And when they did get, the, get them in trouble, Kamala Harris of Calif in California actually got 
a Corinthian. Um, we, were, we got to see the recruiting uh, material where literally they would, like, they would find the pain point of the person they were trying to recruit, usually a single black mother, uh, poor enough to qualify for federal aid because that was actually this game. The game was gaming the federal aid system and ignorant enough to think that a for-profit college was as, um, as good as a private college. And they would find their pain point and promise them that their pain would go away if they just enrolled in online classes. And I should add that even if they did get a diploma from this for-profit college, which the graduation rate was very, very small, like 30%, I think, their diploma would be worth no more than a high school diploma. But in the meantime, they'd be loaded with student debt. It was horrible. I looked into how that worked. I found the same exact industry was going on for payday lenders. And I should say, it was not just any industry. It was the exact technology I was working on, right? I am um, good at my job, which is to say I could figure out, I could target people online. I could profile them. I could put them in tiny little marketing boxes and figure out who's likely to click on that, who's likely to click on this. And that's the same exact technology that these, um, that these industries, these predatory industries are using to find their prey. The VCs like to say that tailored advertising is a service, like, oh, thank you. Thank you for showing me this product I wanted. Nobody ever thanks anyone for that. But the point is that it's not close to a service if you're preying on people with, with things that are going to hurt them instead of help them. So I'm done scaring you. I want to solve problems. I don't want to just alarm people. What are the ways we can approach this? And I hope you guys have ideas. Um, the first thing is, I think we need data scientists to stop thinking of themselves as technicians to start realizing that they have ethical responsibilities. What we have now is we have a system where we embed ethics and our agendas into our objective functions, into our definitions of success and our algorithms. But we don't take responsibility for those injected and embedded values. I want the data scientist of tomorrow to consider themselves a translator of ethics, where they don't get to decide what the ethics should be, but they are in charge of making it very clear what the embedded ethics look like, as well as understanding whether their algorithm is working, monitoring whether it's fair, whether it is following the ethics that they have uh, set out to follow. I also am hoping that lawyers who are, who are good at FOIA stuff can get access to all of these algorithms that, that are actually part of the government that we should know about. We should understand how our civil servants are being assessed in teaching, for example. I think that when somebody's job is on the line, they should be able to inspect that algorithm, that scoring system. And I don't just mean they should be handed the source code because most people can't parse source code, but they should be able to inspect it like on an app. And they should be able to appeal it if it's wrong. I'm always looking for evidence of harm. My editor, when I wrote this book, told me to put blood on every page. And I was like, dude, it's really hard to find victims of these, um, of these algorithms because many of them, people don't even know they're being scored. How are they gonna complain and talk to someone like me? And that's a problem. And having said that, I wrote this book, I finished it um, like a year and a half ago, maybe almost two years ago. And since then, so many ev pieces of evidence have come out of harm, of at least messed up results, um, that I'm, I'm feeling a little bit better about this. But I, I just want to say it, it's like an iceberg thing, right? If you're seeing, you're seeing evidence, then there's just way more shit going on underneath that we're not seeing because everything's so secret and held away from us. We need to update um, protection laws, anti-discrimination laws, to the big data era which I put question marks after that because I don't, I'm not holding my breath um, in the next three and a half years. We need to evaluate our algorithms as black boxes. And I want to, I just, what I mean by that is like sociologists do these tests where they send applications to jobs and some like half of, and they're all qualified, but half of them have like a black sounding name, the other one have a white sounding name and they see what their response rate is. 
We need the machine learning version of that. And that's easy to say, harder to do, but we need to work on it. I'm hoping that litigation comes through that gives some leverage to this stuff. Remember Kyle Beam's dad who filed all those clash action lawsuits? That's still in court. I want that to work. And I want those companies to be fined so much they never do it again. It's not the precedent that we saw after the financial crisis, sadly. And finally, I think that there's some constitutionality challenges. And actually, one of them just came through the courts. In Houston, six teachers who got fired based on their value-added model score challenge it on, on, the constitutional, on constitutional grounds and won. The judge decided that their due process rights had been violated because they didn't understand the way they'd been assessed at their job. And I'm hoping that means that the value-added model will stop being used, but I don't know if it will. I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thank you for the great talk, first of all. And um, so my question is, um, so social sciences have historically been stigmatized by scientific, like scientific community. I want to know if you, um, do you think that this, that's still the case? And how much of a role does it have to play in actually just people creating models and ma ma making biased models. Just like you don't want a user, like an engineer to make a user experience, design a user experience, you want a designer for that. How much do you think that social scientists um, are being left out when making uh, those sort of algorithms that you're talking about? Um, I don't really know what a social scientist is, but I'll say that, ouch. <laughs> I mean, I have some sense, I've met social scientists, but I don't know what it means like, social science, right? But I do want to say that like the claims of oh we're we transcend politics, we you know, the big data is, is the new n equals all. You know, it's all bullshit, right? Like all of all of the delicate nuanced investigations that social scientists have done over the years about understanding causality and understanding like criminality, all that stuff, we need that. And we are pre we're just papering it over. We're like, oh, we're just going to follow the data. Of course, what the data is really doing is saying, we're going to propagate past practices, just like in the Fox News example. And it would be fine if we had a perfect society, but we don't have a perfect society. So yeah, we need that. We need nuanced thinking. We don't have it. Uh, hello. I wanted to ask about um, the example of advertising. Uh, and to allow, uh, so the two ex companies you gave are ones that I think many people might even find questionable to be whether they should even be legal, like for-profit companies and payday loans. But what exactly is the problem with, say, like, if I'm selling farming equipment to only advertise to farmers and not to the man who only wants jet skis? Yeah, I mean, I'm totally vulnerable to luxury yarn. <laughs> and I freaking love that. I love luxury yarn. I don't think there's anything wrong with farm farming equipment. I think that because we, the nature of our siloed existence is online, bad actors are harder to spot. So I, I'm not, and I'm not saying like we should stop at tailored advertising, but I'm saying we should be aware that we're introducing new problems. And that at the worst case, it is actually horrible. Like let's stop pretending this is good news all, all ac across the board. That's what I mean. By the way, I didn't mention political micro-targeting, but at that end, I think it's not only a bad idea, but it is undermining democracy. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could explain sort of how you think about algorithmic policing or algorithmic sentencing as different or similar to sort of their earlier capitulations. So like sentencing guidelines in the 1970s or hotspot policing, are they kind of just algorithmic recapitulations of the same thing? Or do you think there's something distinct maybe in like their inscrutability or in, yeah? So yeah, I'm, I, I'm not trying to claim that anything really new is happening, right? What we have is same old, same old power relationships, racism, sexism, that kind of stuff. What's different about the big data thing is that it is utterly opaque. Um, and it, that makes it a perfect mechanism for bureaucracy. Because in bureaucracy, you know, the, the goal is to have rules. Um, I mean, the true goal is to have rules that make sense and are fair. But it often, you know, loses steam. And we end up hoping for rules that at least we can follow and 
importantly, we are not responsible for because we can point to them and say, the machine told me this. And I think that's where algorithms play um, in a very useful role for the people that use them. That's one of the reasons that you're not going to see people give up their algorithms easily, especially in teacher assessments, right? Teacher assessments, you, would, you might imagine that nobody wants to use that because they're random noise generators, random number generators. But I actually think that they're very useful if you're trying to fight against unions, uh, teacher unions. They're a tool um, because they're, of their inscrutability. So I think, yeah, and it's a cynical way of looking at it, but it just happens to be true. You mentioned the one very specific thing about the sentencing guideline questionnaire that was like asking whether your father had been you know, convicted of a crime or whatever, and that that violates a very specific piece of the Constitution called the corruption of blood co corruption of blood cla clause. And I'm wondering if it's been challenged on that basis yet in, in court. I don't know. Is the answer? Uh, this uh, algorithm, ha this recidivism risk algorithms in general have been have been challenged um, on the, on the due process rights, um, but I don't know about that. Yeah, dude, like, let's, are you a lawyer? I mean, I, this stuff is pretty new and it's pretty secret. And that's why we haven't had enough litigation. But it, this is the time. Let's do this. However, having said that, like, if they just removed that, we wouldn't be happy. It's a weak point. It's a weak point. Just uh, wondering, uh, has the U.S. been a larger kind of violator of this sort yes. of thing? Then, okay, yes. So then, I guess, <laughs> but then I guess the question then is like, why? Why is that? Uh, why do you think that is the case? Um, the answer is that we just trust technology way more in this country than they do, especially in continental Europe, um, and for that matter, the U.K. And the U.K. has the same data protection laws as the as continental Europe, so. They don't have nearly as much profiling of capacity. Uh, having said that, like Facebook works in the UK and, and Europe, so they are still, you know, they're still bearing that burden. But it's just, it's a trust issue. We, the reason I wrote this book, okay, is, is because we are trusting this stuff. Why? Why? You know, as a mathematician, it's easy for me to say that. I'm not intimidated by math. But why are we trusting it? If an alien came down from Mars and said, I have a way of distributing numbers to teachers to tell you how good they are at teaching, I'm not going to explain it, but you can trust me. Like, we'd be like, no, how about no? We're not going to trust you, Mar Martians. But, but because we call it a mathematical algorithm, we trust it. Why aren't we demanding evidence that it works? You know, as a scientist, I'm disappointed in us. And I think it's because we're afraid, we don't really understand the scientific method, or we don't demand it. We just trust technology and, and mathematics, and we're afraid of it too. And that combination is deadly. It's, a, it's a, absolutely cultural. Plus, we have more technology going on in this country, so that's why we do it more than, say, South America. Having said all that, I'm sighing deeply because I, um, it's happening in Russia and China in like really horrible mass surveillance ways. So we're a, we're a leader in for now, but I don't know if it'll last. I was actually thinking from the uh, user perspective, yeah. uh, what metrics can individuals actually use in um, identifying these discriminatory uh, things, and how can what should they do about it? Yeah, I mean, great question. And the sad, sad answer is like we have nothing. We like we have no power. Like most of these things, I should add, are power relationships where the target of the of the scoring system has virtually no power. I know that's like really depressing, but what I'm trying to say is this is an like we have to organize. This is an, a political fight, not a mathematical one. It's not a technological fight. I mean, look, I'm. When I say that, some people do do things that are cool, and I like them, like collect information about the political ads that you're being shown. Like maybe we can backward, back out, like what 
how they decided to show them these to us. But that is, you know, it's so massive on scale and, we, and you only ever have a few people working on it at that level, like the technical level. Um, I think what we need to do rather is to sort of demand accountability, not for all algorithms, but again, for these algorithms that are affecting us deeply. Yeah. Uh, so my question was, what if anything do you think the large uh, software companies could be doing differently to help? Um, well, they could be being accountable. So, I mean, here's, I'm, I'm targeting Google right now, and I've been doing it for the last couple of weeks. Google just came out with this thing where they said they're going to match make people to the jobs, to their jobs. This is Google, right? Google is like the company that were like, oh, like there are more criminal records ads for black sounding names. Not our problem. Like every single time something horrible comes out, they're like, oh, but you know, we're just, we're not trying to be truthful. We're just trying to do this pattern matching thing. But now they're like, oh, we're going to help you find a job. Well, how about you give us evidence that that's fair, that you're doing it in a way that's not just giving better job opportunities to men than to women or to white people or whatever. Like, show me that it's fair. You can't have it both ways where you take no responsibility for discrimination and then you say, you can trust us for your job. So that's a really, I think, obvious case where if they're going to, um, if they're going to be advertising this, this, they have to show show us the the scientific evidence that what they're doing is fair. Um, you talked about um, looking for evidence of harm, um, but I'm in terms of the people who have been affected by these algorithms. But I'm wondering if you've seen evidence of harmful intent, either in the people who are developing these algorithms or the people who are de or organizations that are deploying the algorithms. For example, in the case of Google, you were saying, well, they're, we're just pattern matching. You know, so they can say we're technicians, we're idiots, whatever. Um, but there's probably somebody out there who's actually like, oh yeah, you know, it's it's just ML. But secretly they're like, yeah, we're perpetrating the cycles of poverty and racism, or um, districts that are choosing that know that these things are perpe are perpetuating racism and whatever other issues, um, but are just saying like, yeah, that's that's why we're that's why we're going to use them, but we just won't tell anyone that. Right. So I actually have a piece coming out in The Observer, um, which is part of The Guardian, um, next week about criminal algorithms, exactly this question. I would use VW emission tests as an example of a criminal algorithm, but also Uber's gray ball as an uh, illegal algorithms, and I have a few more examples there. I'd also like if you could hand the microphone to Joy right there, um, because she has a great example. I'm just gonna bring it right over. Where I Whatever Kathy tells me to do. I'm just gonna, have you noticed there's no pattern to me giving the mic to anybody? Right there. Where's Joy? Oh, sorry. Hello. So I'm Joy, founder of the Algorithmic Justice League, and really excited to be here. I wanted to go back to your earlier response in terms of this being something that's more of a, a political space and, of course, is based on technical choices. What steps would you recommend for collective action to demand fairness or accountability inside companies, so interest steps, and also outside of companies as well? I'll do that if you talk about your story and whether you think it's actually criminal or intentional. Got it. So my story, I'm not sure if you've seen it on TED, um, but I have a story where I code in a white mask because the facial detection software I was using didn't consistently detect my face. And what I do is I, I show an example where I have a friend who's detected, light skin. My face comes on, no detection. I put on the mask, oh my goodness, detected. And I take off the mask, right? And this is an inquiry into looking at how computer vision works, the composition of our data sets, and so forth. So in that case where I'm using facial recognition or facial detection software and I'm not being detected, I wouldn't say there is an explicit choice to keep me outside of the system, but there's a difference between opting out and being opted out. And in that case, I was opted out 
not necessarily because I wanted to be, but because of the way the software was tested. And you can go back and look then at who's creating the software in the first place. I studied computer science. I'm now based at the Media Lab, working on my PhD, et cetera. And there aren't that many people who look like me in this room or who look like me in technology in general. And so if we're more intentional about who we have in the room making the technology, it'll be easier to see some of these issues that come up, but it's not just enough to be seen and not heard. And so this example I give happens when I'm a graduate student at MIT, but I ran into it when I was an undergraduate at Georgia Tech studying computer science, working on a social robot. We were playing peekaboo. Peekaboo doesn't quite work if I can't see you, so I would borrow my roommate's lighter face. And then I didn't say anything because I didn't think I had the power or agency for my concern to matter. Thank you, Joy. And I would, I think you're being too kind. I think, I think it is downright negligent and should be illegal to be putting out software on a large scale, at least, that it has only been tested on white people. I mean, it's just nuts at the, in this day and age. Um, in terms of collective action, like, I think my best, my favorite target is teacher unions. You know, dude, why have the teacher unions, why aren't they calling me? <laughs> like, I want to be their expert witness. Um, in, a, in a world, though, where unions are at risk everywhere, it's really hard to know how to collectively organize around these issues. Um, and sadly, like, what that usually means is, like, consumers organize. Consu and it's like, it's like the blowback of, of disappointed consumer customers or even worse shareholders that gets people to do to make action and I wish I wish I had a better answer to that because I think this is a fundamental um, risk for our society and for democracy if we don't address algorithmic accountability as we go further and further into using algorithms to make all the choices for our lives then we are you know we're, we're sort of um, planting the seeds of just crazy inequality, right? Because this is a cumulative effect. I hope I've shown you enough examples to make you realize that a given person who's considered unlucky or in the wrong marketing silo is affected to, at, at every level. I didn't talk about college admissions, but obviously it's there. You know, getting a job, keeping a job. I mean, it's at every juncture, and it, it's being used by demographic data rather than, it's the opposite of the American dream. And it's the opposite of mobility. And we, we need to address it. That was a shitty answer to your question, but a second, yeah. OK. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to touch on you know this really tough question of how do we deal with um, developing models like this when the data you're trying to build these models on are built on you know uh, lots of historical kind of um, biases over time, right? So the criminal justice one's a great example, one we keep returning to. A lot of the conversations about this and a lot of the uproar around this has centered around kind of concepts of neutrality and accuracy up till now, right? So we have a, which is actually kind of how we deal with things like uncomfortable conversations about how we should handle race and gender in general, right? Like people say, we don't see color. We, you know, like, it, it, you know, we have a hard time describing the black man in the room as a black man. We'll be like the guy with the red shoes, X, Y, Z. Right. So, um, but um, it seems like I'm, I'm just want to ask: like, is is that the right goal for us to be going for in terms of neutrality or trying to wipe out, eliminate the proxies that we find in these data, or should we be striving to to develop more thoughtful ways to approach kind of classified things? One thing I just came from a conversation with a man named Adam Foss, who's this amazing man who's doing a lot of uh, restorative justice work with prosecutors right now. And we were actually going through this thought exercise of if you were going to build an assessment to take a more restorative justice approach to um, giving a prosecutor the tools they need to divert people instead of taking them to jail, things like that, what are the types of useful information they'd have? It was actually quite a few of the things that you had listed up here that actually the gentleman over here had problems with. So it's things around, how has the school system treated you? Uh, have you been uh, involved in child protective services? Have your parents had other interactions with uh, in, you know, the institutions of our punitive institutions? Okay. Right? I got it, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I won't answer your question, but I'll say something. It's a big question. The way I look at it, and maybe this means I'm a social scientist now and it's not a data scientist, but the way I look at it is that, you'll have to tell me what a social scientist is and then we can answer that question. Um, 
is that recidivism risk algorithms are not inherently evil. They are actually really rich sources of understanding of society. They tell us so much. They tell us, in fact, that if you've, you've been sort of systematically punished by your circumstances, then you're much more likely to end up in prison. The question is, how do we address that? Do we uh, experiment with interventions? Um, with, hey, maybe we can help you find a job. Maybe that'll reduce your recidivism risk algorithm. Hey, maybe uh, we can give you some really good GRE courses while you're still in prison to help you with your high school, with, with your employment status or whatever. whatever. In other words, they, they point us in the direction of the biggest freaking society problem that we have. And instead of going there, what we're doing is we're shifting the blame to the individual and saying, hey, you've been unlucky so far. Dude, you're going to continue to be unlucky. I mean, that's messed up. But we don't have to do it that way. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so I was thinking a little bit about the ideas that you lined out. And um, I was wondering, in terms of concrete measures, have you considered putting your book or translating your book into a syllabus and actually um, suggesting this to, you know, you said you have the connections to Harvard, to MIT, or even just as an online course. And in that context, um, may I allude you to the fact that um, over at LSE, where I used to teach, we have a course called LSE 100, where we, for instance, um, uh, address the issue of predictive policing and all these things. So maybe this could yeah. be an inspiration. Thanks. Um, I was at the LSE last week. It was really nice. Um, so the answer is, it's impossible, sadly. I would love to do that, but most of the data sets that I just talked about are not available. You cannot get a bunch of people, I mean, I guess you could give people personality tests and like you could do it yourself, um, but you won't know exactly how the, how the companies do it because it's proprietary. Like all the algorithms are proprietary. That was one of my characteristics. Um, so it would be really hard to build a syllabus around this with real data sets. Now, exception might be uh, predictive policing, like anybody, there's, there's enough crime data sets out there, stop and frisk data sets, um, to actually experiment with what that looks like. Joy might have more examples for this. But I'm just saying, like, by, constru by construction of, I'm talking about just, like, destructive secret algorithms, they're secret. And the data that, tr that trains them is data that we will not have our hands on, typically. Having said that, like, let's try. Because I think it would be really instructive. I think... The data, the work you do in a typical statistics class is so misleading, right? It's like, oh, here's like lengths of flower petals or whatever. And it's like, it's perfectly made and clean data sets that are provided to you um, and has nothing to do with human behavior. So there's no ethics involved. And it's just like, can we get beyond that? And so I know we can get beyond that. I know we can do better. I'm not, but I don't think we can actually turn my book into a syllabus. Thank you for your talk. Um, one of the most well-known organizations that we know of fighting on behalf of civil, of civil liberties is the ACLU. And after hearing about you know, these issues with um, algorithms and data science from a number of scientists like yourself, I feel like the ACLU is missing from this fight. And I'm wondering if it's at all prioritized by them amongst the various things that they fight for, um, and if they really need an advanced legal framework to fight for this, uh, because they base their, you know, their lawsuits off what's in the Constitution already. So if they can identify constitutional rights being violated, can they start fighting you know, the secrecy behind this and the questions like the mental health issues and whatnot, or targeting my race or neighborhood and things like that? OK, so a couple of things. First. At the AI Now um, conference yesterday, it was announced that the ACLU is already working with AI Now. And AI Now is investigating this kind of thing. And there was like a $27 million fund of rich people, um, which is already its own problem, who um, are contributing to that. So they are in this. The second thing, though, I want you to be aware of is that the ACLU, I love the ACLU. And I've talked to people, the lawyers there, about questions like this. They do not have subpoena power. The state attorney generals do. So I think you should agitate the state attorney generals along these lines just as much as ACLU. But I think you should, you should know that there's a lot of learning here. Like ACLU is not used to this kind of technology. It's a new beast. And that's one of the reasons it's used so widely, because it's like this new beast that nobody knows how to 
investigate or interrogate. And so it's going to take a few years to catch them up, but I think they're doing it. But I'm please, please agitate in that direction. Thank well, you guys so much.